It's Scott. Welcome to Ask a Puppy Trainer Show, episode 126. Sorry. Guys. We've done it four times already. TikTok's getting tired of us. All right, we're moving on. Look at these adorable puppies. Um, oh, I, and I just a disclaimer them. for our questions them. is we have a lot. We have almost three pages of questions. We're definitely not going to be able to get to all of them, but again, we want to answer some of the live ones as well. So we'll get through as many as possible. You're so, we'll save you're the extra so rushing. Can't for you, the other side. Can't you just live in the in the moment? And, no, and I've been doing this for four months. You got to get on my page now. <laughs> it has not been four months, for the record. It has not been four months. Feels like nine. It's not been. <laughs> all right, great. We've got a question on TikTok. Let's start with that one. You want to read it? You, you won't be able to read it from up there. Your, your mic is back here on my shoulder. a playpen in the living room and they're wondering if that's a bad place for the crate if it's too loud. I love to have a living room crate and then a crate in a quiet room. Mm -hmm. the, you just got to know that you're trying to teach your puppy how to be in the crate alone, learn their independence because they have to. So we need to start with that pretty early and you want to do that in that dark quiet room but then it's also great to have one in the living room give them the option of going in the crate in the playpen or just mm -hmm. have it as backup while you're making dinner things like that because you don't want a puppy running around the house so if you want the, your puppy to spend more time with you a crate in the living room is a great idea another thing i'm realizing too is i have a lot of clients who are telling me that they've craved the dog in the bedroom for the entirety of the time they've been listening to our shows and now when they start introducing the dog to being in the living space with bigger energy the dog can exist. So I do believe in having the dog acclimate to being in the crate in the bedroom to start because that's where it's quiet, it's calm, and it's relaxing for them and they're likely to sleep. However, oh, hey, Jack, that's my boy right there. Mm -hmm. I got both of them now. And then as they get better at doing the crate in the bedroom and you want to start acclimating them to being able to be around some of that energy, if they're doing good, you can only do it if they're doing good, then you can start creating them in that living room crate around some more energy and just see how they do. If there's a lot of whininess, fussiness, and they're really struggling, maybe they're not ready for it. Put them back in the crate in the bedroom or pull them out and train them a little bit. Work down some of that energy and, and get them acclimated. Them. Okay, they're done. Crate, crate them when they're tired is what he's trying to say. Careful, careful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so they're so good. Yeah. yeah, see you boys. Oh my goodness. Okay, uh, someone asked, I don't have a who. My puppy will be eight weeks next Friday. We received her over the weekend. I've never pad trained a puppy before. I know how to outside train them, but how do you keep them on the pad? I'm going, I like this. Okay, be quick. We, we like nothing. to do the playpen. Or you can just kind of keep your hand over the potty pad. But what I find is that most puppies will use it and they still tend to kind of walk off the edge and pee off the edge. So this is actually a Bethany recommendation. I'll give credit where credit's due. She always says lay down three to four and have them overlap each other a little bit. And then I like to put the playpen on top of those four pads. Do you put the playpen too? I didn't until you started doing that more and more and then I tried it. It works way better. I just like it because then I... And by the way, yes, you do stuff to stand with your puppy yep, and hold leash. the leash you pick them up. because yeah. you're acclimating them to go and potty on leash yep. on command where you choose. When you eventually want to wean off those potty pads, though, you can start moving that playpen area closer to the door where you're eventually going to take them out. I bet you Bethany would say skip all this because I've heard her say it before. Yeah, I would. I, you can do that if you're really struggling, but yep. otherwise, after a month, remove one puppy pad. Mm -hmm. Okay. After another two weeks, remove another one, and then always be down to two puppy pads. That's kind of my opinion, especially before they're six months old. And if they go, uh, they go somewhere else. They don't go on the pad. They're telling you they're not ready. Put the pad back. Yep. All right. And then go. also, no, 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 when you do eventually want to take them outside, you need to ask yourself, do I want an inside potty dog or an outside potty dog? If you're using both inside and outside, it is mentally challenging for a dog to figure out what you want from them if you eliminate the pot or if you eliminate the playpen and you're not doing it on leash. Correct. So our recommendation, if you want them to pee outside when they hit an age where they're vaccinated and able to do so, cut the potty pads, put them on leash, take them outside, stand out there with them, and if they don't potty, put them in the crate rinse and repeat until they go potty free outside and then they get their free time on leash. Okay, Olivia says, four month old lab cries every car ride. 
We take him daily, we ignore her, we play calm music. Is it just um, the timing? Any tips? Four month old lab cries in a car ride. Uh, are you seat belting? Are they pacing? Are they in a crate? So what I like to know is, is yeah, good. because when they're pacing, it's like every time they pace, the anxiety gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they start whining, crying, yipping, yeah. or barking out the window. So we would suggest that you use a crate until mm -hmm. you've taught your puppy to lay down in the back seat and you can reinforce that down verbally or with a second person in the car or at every stoplight to reinforce that down. And then also feed in the car. Don't go places um, every time that you use the car. Sometimes just feed the puppy in the car. Your puppy's a little young to go in and out a million times, but you could start doing a little bit of in and a little bit of out, like maybe three, four times. Maybe there's uh, they're feeling a little bit sick. That's really common for young puppies. But anyway, play around with those things and let us know if uh, if that helps. But I know it's a lab, so it's already kind of big. But honestly, confinement at this age until they can do a down is really, really helpful. And not everyone will be able to put a crate in their car. If you can't, get a seatbelt for them. Uh, there's a lot of gimmicky seatbelts out there. Don't do one with the bungee cable. If you're going to get a brand one, I recommend Sleepy Pod. It's the only one that they've actually crash rated or crash test rated. And they've actually done dummy crash tests with fake dogs wearing those seatbelts. And they're the most secure. But also it prevents dog from spinning and being able to drag that bungee cord across the car yeah. and still pace back and forth. There is no bungee. It's literally the seatbelt that goes through, which is already crash tested anyway. So right, it's the safest possible form. Chris Tic Tacs? Okay, Chris something. Says, do you have any tips for desensitizing puppies to flying? Eight month old Pomeranian. Absolutely, I'm gonna start. Uh, and some of them are tips from Sparky. I'm gonna steal his, he steals mine. So one of them is if you're around some sort of speaker or something like that, you can play airplane noises through YouTube while working on sit down and being calm. The next thing you wanna do is I love rocking chairs. Um, I don't want like crazy rocking to, to happen, but if you have like a minor rocking chair or even if it's a, a you know a lazy boy or something, have your puppy go in the lazy boy, go in the rocking chair, lay down, and then just do light movement as well. And then you layer on the sounds with the movement and this is all to build confidence up. If you're if it's a Pomeranian, don't have them walk on the escalator. You always want to pick them up. They should be in a carrier anyway. I know sometimes they're lenient with that, and some people might be okay with you not having your puppy in a carrier. But trust me, you don't want to deal with uh, picking up poop in the middle of somewhere because your Pomeranian is walking with you. And uh, pick up for elevators. Because here's the thing, if you try to use an elevator or escalator and you've also got a bag and things like that and your dog is a little dog, especially is next to you, mm -hmm. you don't even want to think about all the ways that leash can get caught in places and the edge of that tail. So in a carrier is best or at least be holding your puppy. But for the prep, I would suggest the chair and the noises. What about you? I'm going off the elevator thing again. Uh, when I acclimate dogs to being on the elevator, which is to me the closest thing that rec that is similar to the vertigo of an airplane going up, losing gravity and going down and gaining gravity, the elevator gives you the best part of that. What I do to start with is I put them in a dog stroller for a small Pomeranian, easy. Get a, a dog stroller? Stroller. You can the, also just do a carry bag. There's a reason for it. Because the wheels in the stroller absorbs the shock of the up and down of it. And then eventually I move them to their carrier, which they're gonna be on for the airplane. And I set the carrier on the stroller and then eventually on the ground. I that's, thought it, that's if you're really struggling, I would think. Most people are really going to struggle on their first airplane ride. I do four of these a month. I'm and just trying a lot to think of, of the on. cost of a stroller and a carrier. You can get one on Facebook Marketplace for $15. There, I there. see them there every day. There you go. Don't go buy a $300 there stroller. Go. go to Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> All right. Trust Sarah, me. Sarah Murphy says, uh, lab, nine weeks old, how do I help my puppy get comfortable in the car, he cries the whole time. Oh, we... We, we kind of already answered this one. Yeah, and nine weeks old. Okay, so go back to the first question. It's a four-month-old lab, but mm. just to tap into this nine-week-old puppy, that's not surprising at all. This puppy needs a lot of calming work. Honestly, doing a program like our online school where you're teaching thresholds, how to be calm, how to go to place, things like that, that will help you with the car stuff because he doesn't have any inhibition right now to, to know how to go somewhere, be calm and settle. When you ask him to, you're like, okay, hey, you're fine, lay down. 
You don't have that skill yet, so there's really not much you can do except food work and a crate for right now. And then also go and listen to that. You're not training, question. you're creating comfort. Yeah. You're creating a comfort understanding Without and eventual coddling, trading. But not through coddling. Not what does that mean? What does that mean? Not comfort through coddling, like holding and loving all the puppies like we were in the beginning when we first got here. <laughs> and also an airbag can kill a dog under, I think it's like 30 pounds with one hit. Wow, you just gotta, you always gotta go there, right? Yeah, I saw multiple hearts on that one because people like that. They like truth. Truth! Yeah. All right. Jordan says, I have a female toy poodle that pees and poops in her kennel all day. I need, or daily, I need help. She's nine months old. Oh, she, that's all you about me. Oh, I answered enough of those questions while you're gone. I'll okay. Take it. All right. So here's the thing. Your puppy's nine months old, uh, Jordan. So they're in the habit of doing it, unfortunately. Um, if I'm you, I'm actually putting a puppy pad in there just to soak up, you know, some of that in the meantime, because I bet that's really tough to, to clean up and uh, assuming they're not puppy pad trained. <laughs> and so what I would do is really, really monitor water and food intake. And so anytime I give this puppy water, if I put them in crate and they're peeing with, within 15 minutes, then I'm putting them, them in there for five minutes, taking them out and giving them a chance to pee back in crate for 15, see if they pee again, just to learn the habits of my dog. When are they peeing, how much, things like that. that reminds me of Rambo. And you're really monitoring water. And so you, uh, uh, let's see, nine month old toy poodle is not getting that much water. So if you go for a walk and then she's guzzling all this water and then peeing every 20 minutes for an hour, then pull back on the water, take her out to pee once, then offer her water again. See if she actually really needed it or if she was just guzzling from play or a walk. Does it say the weight? Just toy poodle, nine pounds. Nine, month, nine, nine months. Nine months, I mean. Okay. Um, so play around with learning the schedule in which she pees and crate. I know that's a lot of work, so on your days off, you're devoting it to this. I would even get a camera on the dog, and if I'm on the computer or I'm watching TV, the camera is right there. And I can see if my puppy starts to move or something. And I can be preventative. I can Pacing get in. back and forth, yeah. circling in the crate. I can be preventative and I can get in there and I can take her out. Or I can just see when she peed and or pooped and I can be like, okay, I fed her at this time. The pooping issue, I would definitely uh, structure your exercise more if you're not already. So feed, exercise, crate. She poops, right? You gave her a chance, but she didn't, but she did 15 minutes in crate. Well, that's because her stomach kind of set or just system settled. So maybe it's feed, exercise, a few minutes in place commander and a down stay next to you to settle her system or a few minutes in crate, not 15, then a poop chance outside. She doesn't poop, crate, five minutes because not 15 because then she'll poop and crate. So you see what I'm doing here? So I'm really kind of breaking down. I'm, I'm reverse engineering, you know, the, the issue. That's what I would suggest. Okay. So the measurement said, of water that I give for a small dog, just so you know, I just finished training a toy poodle and this dog would pee itself 10 times in a row over two hours. The woman had to get down to measuring spoons, a one tablespoon of, of water in a very small bowl boom, every two to three hours was all she could give her dog. The dog was hydrated, never had dry gums, never had any signs of dehydration. You can check for dry gums. If they're, if they're mm -hmm. sticky, she needs water. If they're slick and your finger can move easily, usually it's good. But yeah, if you're trying to figure it out and you're having a lot of accidents, get down to a measuring spoon and figure out how much water your dog actually needs. If they're still heavily panting after they drink, wait 10 to 15 minutes with them in crate, sitting in one spot. And if they don't have an accident and they're not panting anymore, you're, You're good. good. And you can find out exactly how much with your dog on online, on the internet. You can look mm -hmm. up how much your dog needs for that. Okay. All right. Sabrina says, serious question. What should I do when I leave for work? I feel guilty having my dog in crate for five to six hours. I'm going to interrupt you really quick. Kimberly, can you call Pops, please? He called me twice. That's usually when the dog gets out of the yard. Thank you. So, uh, so Sabrina is five, six hours in crate. Should I put him on leash? and tie it somewhere and keep them in a fenced area no, or keep them in a fenced area. Do not back tie your dog when you're not there supervising him for everybody. I'm not getting on to you, Sabrina. That is an understandable question. Yes, she is. No, she's not. Yeah, that probably just sounded like mush in the microphone. Yes, she is. I think you're being all slick. All right. I'm looking forward to learn. Please, any shared advice. Okay. So here's the thing. It depends on where you live. 
if you live in an environment where you don't have a ton going on in your neighborhood and you have a super safe yard and your dog likes like the side run of a yard or a small area of the yard, you can try that. Some dogs do really well with that. But if your dog does great in crate, it's better to do that because what does happens to a dog, even a puppy, when you put them in the yard, you're creating a potential guard dog scenario. Even if they're not a guard dog breed, you're, you're potentially overstimulating them so they start barking at every squirrel, every bird, every noise, every dog that walks by and they hear it through the fence. There can be pros and cons to having a dog outside, never back tie when, you're not, when they're not supervised. But there can be pros and cons to that, but I don't know enough about where you live and the temperament of your dog. Also age. Age and, matters too because yeah. if I have a dog that's eight months old, he can do six hours in the crate while I'm at work. No problem whatsoever. They're sleeping usually yeah. anyway. Yeah. If I have a dog that's four months old, then I probably only get about three, maybe four hours. Before but I don't know where you guys live, but we do. We have a lot of rovers in our area. I probably have half our clientele that have medium age dogs, six months old, that only can do five hours. And they have a rover come in at the four and a half hour mark, take him out for a potty, oh, give a please. little bit of play, like five minutes, put him back in the crate, and then you take him out when you get home. So that's a big option for us down here in the city. If you guys have that option, that's awesome. If you have a neighbor kid who can do it for you, pay him 15 bucks or something, there's a couple options for you. Did you mention the playpen setup, the playpen crate setup? No, I, I wouldn't do I wouldn't do a playpen um, unless it's, I, I don't do playpens if I'm gone for five, six hours. Playpen with the crate inside of it. No, they, it's for me, they get, I, I have yet to meet a dog that couldn't get out of a playpen at some point. I, I've been given the advice. I kind of still like it. What I would do is I'd have a playpen set up. I'd put the crate inside of it. But just so you know, you were looking at a much taller playpen. You're looking at probably the 56 inch because they can't be able to climb it and they can't be able to jump it. But they also and can't be able to push it. Correct. Like the re well, that thing is heavy. That thing weighs 45 what, pounds. What thing? The, fi the 56 inch playpen. It's literally 56 inches tall. All the playpens I see are either plastic or wire. So I don't know what Wire playpen, 56 inch. They use reinforced steel because it's such a large playpen and it weighs about 40 pounds. So it's not the foldable wire one. It is. I'm telling you, you get a five month old uh, Labrador, they're going to push it all around the room. Uh, okay, yeah, lab, yes. That dog, was that lab? We don't know. Well, we don't know what kind of dog you have. <laughs> okay, so anyway, you, you get the nuance, okay? We can move Anyone on. Anyone else watching, throwing in questions, emailing them in, texting them, whatever you're doing? Age and breed. Yeah, age and breed. Because we could give you a much more direct answer. And if you're on, throw the age and breed. Kimberly will pick it up and communicate it to us. Yeah. We'll try to help you more if we know that. Is there a question on there, Kimberly? No. We have like 10 <laughs> questions. Oh, okay. TikTok is like all about their online oh, questions. Wow. Three-month-old German Shepherd barking and chasing the cat. So the cat needs to have its own separate space. That is critical. The cat always needs to have an out. So that means in every room, there is somewhere where the cat can get to easily to get up and away. This is just basic uh, rules of having, to, uh, you know, predator versus mm, they act like prey. They're also predators, but they can't be. A and that dog needs to be on a leash. Anytime that dog is not on a leash, we have no control. More than that, control is like kind of like a buzzard right now. Leverage is the word I like. Feeling like you're in control of a situation that would normally feel uncontrollable. Dog goes towards the cat tree, never touches that cat tree. No paws, no nose, no nothing. Not you can guide them away. That is your cat's area. That's their crate in a sense. That is their safe zone. If it gets invaded, they break trust and then you don't have a good relationship between your cat and your dog. Uh, more than that though, you need a really good place command. You need to be able to say out from an area and then guide them to place. Place teach them to go to a designated area on command and stay there until released. It gives you control over situations that would normally feel uncontrollable. And this takes time and practice and your mm -hmm. puppy is still really young. You have to set them up to succeed. Anytime your cat is out and not in their designated room or area, that puppy is on leash. You want to give your puppy a little bit of a break. It should still be supervised, of course, but a little bit of a break. The cat is closed off in the daughter's room or in their wherever, their area, and then the puppy can be out. This is critical because if your cat is running and acting like prey, you could have a real problem in a few months when your German Shepherd hits adolescence and starts to get some of those um, emotions with, when it comes to play and prey, it's a muddy water for them. A little predator prey situation. I mean, even a young puppy though, big teeth, bites your cat, they could hurt your cat. Yeah, mouthing, like hard plenty. paw. Yeah. 
I know you see all the cute TikToks of all the sweet dogs and the cats. Well, that might not be your dog. So you got They come out of the womb like that if they're like that. Yes, exactly. And so you've got to set your puppy up to succeed by teaching them like what's okay mm -hmm. and what's not okay. Can we do something from Instagram just because we answered a few TikToks? I'm just going to read that one just because I already got the mic on. All right, we are getting an F1 standard burn doodle puppy in December. Any tips for introducing to an 11 year old female spaniel and a seven year old cat? 11 year old spaniel has been an only dog for two years now. They won't like the puppy potentially. Nope. And so you've got to make sure that what you're doing is you are protecting and advocating for your animals that were there first. Yep. This is critical. So if your older spaniel uh, might love your puppy and then be like, I've, I've had enough, like, and you need mm -hmm. to interrupt that and you need to intervene quickly. Or your spaniel, your older spaniel may not like the puppy at all. And that's okay. You have to respect that and you have to do more crating and more structure with your new puppy to advocate for your older dog and cat in the house. Mm -hmm. That is numero uno, number one. The yes, easiest way to damage a relationship between a new dog and an older dog that's already been in your house is by giving them freedom and to let the older dog work it out. Or older dog will teach the puppy. They sometimes do if you got a really, really balanced dog. The two dogs I've ever known in my entire career that can do this efficiently, all right, three is Caesar Milan's dog, her dog, and my dog. Those are the only dogs I've ever met that can put down a puppy respectfully and back off and give it space to as a teaching learning lesson. I don't know any other dogs that do that because we had to teach our dogs how to do that. Yeah, we had to teach him. So, and now don't get me wrong, you might have some easygoing spaniel that's so sweet and but then you bring in this puppy and if it's not the perfect energy for that sweet spaniel that might check a dog and do it appropriately, but maybe it's too soft for this crazy, maybe the puppy's energy is bigger than your older dog's energy. So there's so many factors at play that you just want to, you know, know advocating first. Um, also, I would just make sure both dogs are on leash and the puppy is on leash with the cat and just see how the cat is around. Uh, have a crate in your living room as well as the crate in a quiet room for quiet time, but have a crate in your living room. So your puppy can really hang out in the living room and see the dynamics of the home with the cat and the older dog. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Jennifer Maples, how do you get them not to chew on the leash? I really could use age and breed because that would make a difference in what we're saying, but if it's 16 weeks and younger, you're not pulling the leash so much and you're doing tons of food for two weeks. Everything is food. The, the leash is only there so your puppy doesn't get away. Once you've done your two weeks of food work and like follow me around and things like that, which we teach in our online school, and there's a lot of programs you can seek out in order to, to teach that, then you teach your puppy how to view leash pressure, okay? How to understand to give in to leash pressure. Then there's a phase, because I don't have age, if your puppy's six months or older, that you can actually give the leash a tug because you've got this great foundation. Your puppy knows what to do, but you've got all these steps that you have to do first. So if you'd write back with age and breed, we'd really appreciate it and we could expand more. You wanna do the long one? Okay. Nope, you can do that one after. <laughs> hey, let's grab one of these. Cause I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna paraphrase it. Let's grab a TikTok one. Um, my puppy keeps jumping on me and biting my arm really hard. Uh, so my puppy is jumping up and biting my arm really hard and can't redirect it. This puppy needs to be on a leash from the moment it comes out of crate. So if you've done crate training, the dog is not allowed out of crate like until you invite them out. So you open the door, shut the door until the puppy has this back motion. Then you leash up the puppy, puppy gets all excited again. You do the door exercise again. Then you invite the puppy out, puppy jumps up, leash pressure immediately. Puppy calms down, food work, food work, food work, food work. Jumps up on you, pressure, leash pressure. Rinse and repeat. And yep. I would really uh, emphasize doing some sort of program that focuses on thresholds, front door, back door, crate threshold, playpen threshold, jumping through, cause that's a threshold kind of, and get a little bit more of an understanding, a respect understanding between you and your puppy to teach your puppy that when they actually move backwards, that's when they get what they what they want. So you gotta have that foundation before you can really address the jumping up and nipping. Because usually if you have a foundation and you do some leash pressure and you build that foundation with them, you won't have 
90% of the nipping, you know, in the first place. Let's take it to the next step though too. And how much affection are you giving your dog Ooh. and how much training are you doing with your dog? If I'm doing a five to one ratio, a four to one ratio, I do eight minutes of training and I give my dog affection for like four or five minutes after, you might be in a pretty good spot. If you're bringing your puppy out, give them super big cuddles, and the next time you're busy on a work call, bring them out for a quick potty, and they're jumping up, biting at your elbow, pulling at your clothes, that's a relationship disconnect, which means that you need to create a better balance. But what Bethany mentioned about that crate door, that is literally setting the standard for the next 30 minutes to an hour of your puppy being out of the crate. Yep. If they're crazy coming out of the crate, they're crazy for the next hour, and it takes 10 times longer to work them down. Yep. I think that when you work a puppy, there's two places that you go to. You can only work a dog down so far, which means you're working this big energy reserve lower to get them more manageable. There's only so far you can go before you have to do what she said, which is that pressure, hold, release, redirect, place, sit down, or whatever, whatever you can do with your puppy. Doing, yeah. Even just eight comes in a row, puppy come, good, food. Puppy well, come, well, good, food. I probably, I would probably do crate, let's go. Crate, well, that's pretty let's good. go. Crate, sit. Let's go. And doing the pause at the gate. If I do that for 10 to 15 minutes and wear the brain down before I even bring them out to play potty, if you can, it depends on how old your puppy is. Um, but that's, that's where I'd go. I might take them out to potty, bring them right back in the house and do that crate pattern. This is routine. our puppy meditation. By the way, it makes you want to take a nap too. <laughs> but I actually really, slow. really enjoy this routine that she's yeah. talking about because it's ultra slow. You pause at every step and kind of see if they're calm or if they need something to help them calm like a sit. Yeah. But if they're darting in the crate, that's not it. You they keep going. They have to be slow. They have yeah. to be calm. You do it long enough, they're going to be darting out of the crate and then 10 minutes later, they're like, like falling out of the crate. They're so tired. <laughs> that's when you're that's in the That's what money. you want. Yeah. That's what you want. Perfect. Uh, you want to scroll down a little bit so we can, I want to get another TikTok one because I, I think there was some previously. There's we had a lot. One. A lot of comments. Thanks for your comments, guys. Do you recommend doggy? No. Do you know what that says? Doggy when diapers. Training training? Well, when training, doggy no. Diapers. For elderly dogs, yes. Yeah, doggy diapers aren't training. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Doggy diapers are a crutch to make it so your older dog doesn't keep urinating on himself. Not because he can control it, because he can't. What age do you start leash training? Is, is 10 weeks old too young for leash training? I put a leash on an 8-week-old dog. I pulled a leash on any dog. As long as they need the leash and they're a bit too wild, oh, heck no, I'll do it anyways. I put a leash on any dog walking in my home because that's my source of leverage, but it's also their source of safety. Yeah. They can walk up, open up a cabinet, chew on some like piece of like packaging and have me rat poison. You never know what they're going to get into. When I walk into a person's house that has babies and I see baby locks on everything, that's what my house looks like with a puppy coming in. <laughs> I will puppy proof just like you would baby proof and the leash is a part of puppy proofing. However, I should say that that's not really leash training though. That's, oh, I'm talking about leash control, that's leash just, leverage. That's leverage. You know, that's to make sure you have focus with your puppy. Your puppy's not running and getting into spots when you're trying to train or just in general, right? When it comes to actual leash training, you want to spend a few days or with some cases a few weeks of the, the leash is just there for safety. Dragging. And you're doing food work, mm -hmm. food movements to build up the repetition of patterns that you want to create. Then you layer leash pressure onto what you've already trained with food to teach them how to give in the leash pressure rather than be resistant. That's leash training. And you can mm -hmm. do it with some mature 10 to 14 week old puppies. But since you're asking the questions, I'm thinking, asking that question, I'm thinking you need to do drag leash or hold the end of the leash and focus on training, let's go and even heal with just food. Creating and, leverage. And then you layer leash pressure on top of that. So for now, I'm saying place and the puppy's just jumping on following food. Well, in a week, I'm going to say place and add a little leash pressure towards, you know, the dog bed and teach the puppy to give into that leash pressure to do the same command he's been practicing. And so that's how you build that up and you should start right away. Why do you guys think she waited a week though to introduce leash pressure? Because opposition reflex is when a dog fights pressure instead of giving in. She created a positive association to wanting to go on place, using food, building relationship, creating leverage. And then when she adds a leash, I'm betting you it's still going to create some frustration. But all she's looking to do is create that tension, show the food, and when the puppy gives in just a little 
little bit. Give slack, follow it up with food. You're teaching the puppy to give in to pressure and want to earn the food. All right, guys, it is already 1.30, and I loved um, being back here with you guys. I missed it so much, and I just want to say, Emily, Jade, Natasha, Heather, some user comments. Alex, we're going to save you all for next week. You're going to be first. That's and, crazy. That went by so quick. And we're going to save you guys for wow. uh, next week. So it's really good to be back, and we'll see you all later. Pocket smile. <laughs> I know. Did you miss it? Put a...